Hello everyone, it is Friday, which is a good thing. It's Friday afternoon, which is a better thing. Almost and, the weekend. <laughs> and it's highs and lows time, which is the best thing, of course. <laughs> so, uh, welcome to Campaign's Highs and Lows. Uh, we are in Hong Kong at the Campaign Asia Pacific newsroom and our headquarters. I'm Robert Sawatsky together with Jenny Chan, Jenny Chan. and uh, Sun Chen Kang. Grayish Tim. A great, oh yeah, that's right, we are Team Grey a little bit today. I'm, I'm a bit more blue, but anyways, don't uh, don't take cues from our... Our, uh, our colors to be... Our color scheme. High. That's right. There actually is a bit, a little bit more uh, of, a, of a high today in, in the, the material that we're talking about. We're going to be talking about uh, Singles Day coming up this year. Already the countdown has begun. Yes. We're going to be talking about Uber and its attempts to kind of push its brand in Asia, targeting Asia specifically. Um, but I want to start with uh, gender equality. Uh, still, um, we're seeing more uh, coming out from the you know, meet, hashtag MeToo campaign and around the scandal uh, that uh, the, the involved Harvey Weinstein. And we're, in our industry, we're seeing you know, more, more stuff come out, I guess. We've talked to you before about kind of what Cindy Gallup is doing, that she's asking for names. Um, names and specific cases of sexual harassment. We've seen some reports also come out in our media, even here in Asia. Um, so I think that kind of those are important things, and it's important to hear kind of those stories. We too would you know welcome to hear any of, of those stories as well. But some of the agencies themselves also on a kind of a higher level are taking action as well, Jenny, right? Yeah, I mean, um, IPG Global CEO Microsoft was the first agency that came out with a very specific, you know, instruction or or a guarantee for whistleblowers to, to protect their safety if they, you know, come up with any any stories or any any, any names, which is what uh, Cindy Gallup and which is what actually we in Asia would like um, in order to bring this issue forward. I guess it's just a kind of creating that um, that comfort kind of area for people to come forward because obviously it's mm -hmm. so it's so difficult, right? There are um, there are there are some anonymous uh, sources telling stories about um, certain sexual sexual anecdotes they had encountered but without any without any names they just remain stories and we we weren't able to help them or bring the issue forward. So this my, um, IPG CEO's memo is actually sort of an injection of confidence to other agencies. I hope other agencies will follow suit. Mm -hmm. I think the most difficult challenge is that people are very afraid to come forward. Yeah, for I think the various, fear is yeah. much more here in Asia. Right. It's very mm -hmm. hard to get the stories and because most of the most of them are subordinates and they are very afraid, just like what is happening with the Harvey Weinstein problem, they are yeah. very afraid to cross their bosses. Mm -hmm. If you notice something in the entertainment circle, all these whistleblowers are people who are already established in their in their careers, right? People who come out against Kevin Spacey and all the others Hollywood stars. They are they have um, established a level in their career to the point they're not scared anymore. But yeah. I think advertising, we, we need more help, we need more protection, we need more guarantees from people already in power. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a good point. I mean, one uh, not moving maybe a little bit away from the direct issue of uh, sexual harassment, but mm -hmm. certainly um, in the realm of you know, making a workplace, uh, you know, a place that, you know, uh, encourages kind of more uh, women leadership and, um, you, know, you know, prevents, you know, discrimination. Uh, we held Campaign 360 about th six months ago, yeah. um, back in March, and we had, as part of that, there were six media agencies that signed on to a mandate for change uh, there, which was, um, I guess came about because only about 30 or 31 percent of them originally had said that they had some plan to kind of basically develop uh, gender equality within their companies. So what they signed on to was like uh, in four different areas. One was to kind of create a plan, a general overall sort of plan to promote um, uh, gender equality awareness in companies and so on. And that number has since grown to 67%. So two-thirds of them have a sort of a plan now that they're working towards. The other areas were around uh, flexible work arrangements. And it was asked that they, um, you know, provide training for managers in terms of teaching them about the benefits of having flexible work arrangements. And there, all of them say that they've done that or else have already kind of those kinds of plans in place. 
Um, the other area was around mentoring. Five out of six of them, 83% said they already have you know mentoring uh, plans in place. I think many uh, ad agencies already had you know had some kind of mentoring you know, program, just even professionally to move along, not specifically necessarily necessarily just for women. Yeah, one of the agencies. Um, in the mandate, they mentioned that they are they made an appointment for every mentor to mentor somebody who is of, of the opposite sex. I guess the rationale of it was that to encourage the exchange of to, to enforce this to encourage the exchange between the two genders yeah, and, and empathy. Even even though I, I do I, even though I do think that uh, marriage should be the married and other more. Other credentials should be the prerequisite for mentorship rather than gender, but I think that's one way to enforce that everyone is mentoring mm -hmm. to en enforce diversity in the agency, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Can see that. Um, the other area was uh, around pay parity, and this here, um, this was to commit to conduct a pay audit to make sure that there is equal pay for uh, you know both genders. And there, 83% have you know said they've either done it or are they are planning to do it. I think that kind of requires planning to is a keyword because well, we don't agree, have it. yeah, um, there may be some follow up more follow up required here. I think that's a touchier one too because if you know they're depending on you know what that determines, obviously there would have to be kind of some action taken on that, and that you know does have a financial component and so on. Interestingly enough, when. When the UK did this um, about a year ago with the industry, the IPA did an audit and they, they found that there wasn't a discrimination. What they found, well there was and there wasn't. I guess what they found was that I think 50.4% 50, 50 of the industry of the uh, people earning salaries were women. They were earning about 44% of the total salary. However, what they determined was that the reason for the discrepancy was that more women were opting into flexible work arrangements where they had reduced time, mm -hmm. and that when they actually came to look at the differences, there was it was not um, as significant. But it would be interesting to see if any um, do share kind of those those uh, stats once they've done their pay audits, because um, that that would be something that'd be really interesting. Yeah, okay, I mean that's a that's a problem as an issue for the maybe HR to sort of reset the pay policy in order to recognize women who might be still putting the hours but just That's right. more flexibly. Yeah. Mm. Whether or not kind of the flexibility means that you know salary has to be given up or not, etc. That's yeah, that's an ongoing debate. Mm -hmm. um, the other kind of area was around unconscious bias training. We we did a whole video on this at Campaign yes. 360 mm -hmm. last year mm -hmm. and the importance of that. 50% have conducted unconscious bias training since that time. So I think that's a start, but it was kind of a, I think that when we're talking also about the kind of the Me Too movement and so on, having that unconscious bias training, training I think would go a long way to making mm -hmm. everyone feel more comfortable. In I like the, the name of it, like, you know, your hands up for... Uh, unconscious bias uh, training, so to identify your stuff that you don't even know it yourself. Um, I guess it's uh, like women themselves are getting a little bit more conscious and putting their hands up. Um, I see, I recently, I mean, two months ago, got an email from a publicist, Hong Kong, I think, business director who prided herself to be, uh, you know, a women leader, but when she got pregnant, she got. Um, uh, worried that this image of her being a very strong woman was going to be shaken and she put her hand up to, to a letter company or a lot of male colleagues that, you know what, um, I'm going to be, uh, because of my pregnancy, I'm, I'm going to need more flexible hours, I'm going to be maybe in better shape after the pregnancy, in top shape, um, and it's just because of the physical changes in the body. So, and they were very understanding of that. She consciously raised her hand to alert um, the company of a situation and, uh, and everybody supported her. So if we see more of such uh, instances, that would be great. Mm. Yeah. 
Uh, a lot of the unconscious bias also seep into the creative work, so by internally training, the creatives will, will be more alert and aware of the gender issues as I've been, I've been spoke, speaking to one of the creatives from LBS Digital mm -hmm. and he should say that she has to address her own unconscious bias when shooting a mm -hmm. campaign for a female mortal fighter mm -hmm. because in her mind she wants her to behave more femininely, more womanly mm -hmm. and so that's one of the, one of the mindset be, that she has to change herself even from the from a perspective of a female creative. It's interesting, yeah, because we always think of it as a workplace environment issue, but it mm -hmm. also ends up being kind of you know uh, you know workplace production uh, issue as well. Um, let's move to Singles Day. Looking, to, I, so anyways, I would mm -hmm. actually count that as a high in terms of the fact that kind of one we're you know monitoring and we're seeing some progress being made on the, the gender equality side there. Um, also looking for another high then is mm. Alibaba now with Singles Day coming up. That yeah, was a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess it's a bad a segue, but very, very <laughs> but considering that what they had what 18 billion in sales uh, last GMB year, last year, uh, mm. U.S. dollars to try to beat that every year, you think it's going to get tougher and tougher for them. So what do, what do they have in store? I mean, it's really really big numbers this year because um, it's eight more days, but it's the ninth anniversary of the whole Singles Day festival. So you know, Alibaba and, and its rivals have have upped their notch, certainly. And I mean, analysts are saying it's not going to be difficult to beat that 18 um, uh, million GMV dollar value this year. This year, they got a lot more new tricks up their sleeve. Um, the key focus being new retail. New retail basically merging offline with online. And we have a lot of numbers here. We have. Um, uh, Okay, 15 million Alibaba product listings in total from 140,000 brands and out of which uh, 60,000 international brands and out of which 60 designer brands are going to allow real-time purchase of the runway. And coming back to the new retail um, technique, uh, there, there's going to be for the first time 600,000 you see this mom and pop convenience stores on the streets and rural uh, stores, they call it retail centers in the villages scattered in the rural areas going to participate in the re uh, new retail format uh, via the first time having QR codes and offline and then trying to link the products up to, to online. And then, so that's Alibaba, but we don't really, I mean, J JD doesn't want Alibaba to dominate the whole single state. And, what it has done is to uh, tie up with its rival, Tencent, and also to tie up with one of its biggest shareholders, uh, Walmart. So what they're doing is also interesting. They, they're creating this JD Tencent retail marketing solution, um, trying to use um, purchasing data from the 900 million users of WeChat, and they're going to give discounts to WeChat Pay users when they uh, pay using WeChat Pay. And obviously, using Walmart's 400 uh, offline stores, they're going to fulfill some of the online orders via Walmart's offline. So everybody's going, there's no a whole new retail, even though the term is coined by uh, Jack Ma about uh, three, four months ago. And something interesting is also the whole big push outside of mainland. It's definitely become global this year. This year's the first time they had the word global in the shopping festival. Last year, we, we did see it last year already a little yeah. bit too. Yeah. They were pushing out into you know Southeast Asia, or, or or others were adopting it, right? Trying to jump onto the the singles bank. Mm. Uh, singles bank. Well, see, I guess because I, I tried personally to buy stuff on it last year, and I think it was a trial. The payment was a bit of a pain. I had to go through three hoops in order to pay by here in Hong Kong. But this year, I heard Southeast Asia, you know, big push. Um, Hong Kong as well, Taiwan, big push. Uh, via Lazada, I think we've seen China's more details. So Alibaba acquired Lazada last year, so and it, Lazada is one of the biggest shopping platforms in Southeast Asia, in Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, uh, Philippines. And so to tie in with the single stay, Lazada, Lazada launched, uh, because in the Lazada tradition, they have the online revolution every 12th of December. Mm -hmm. So since last year, they launched their online revolution on Singles Day and carry it forward to 12th of December, which they are also doing this year. So it's very much uh, a vehicle for Alibaba to push their Singles Day 
think I'll say feminine, feminine as I still call it to Southeast Asia. Does, does it lose something when you stretch it a month though? Well, it's, some of the hype is on the first day, but all the slower moving products, they, they can buy it throughout the month. Mm. They also have a Taobao collection on uh, Lazada, the big C2C, mark, C2C marketplace. And start, they, they have also, so in a push for more cross border e commerce, they have also started with introducing Chinese products on Tmall on Lazada since last year. But this year they are doing even further by introducing 100 Chinese brands. Mm, those homegrown push. Homegrown Chinese. What are the yeah. countries that are pushing these 100 homegrown brands? Uh, to for last year they mm. mentioned that the a few countries from Europe, surprisingly, like France, Ukraine, and Russia, are the biggest buyers of Chinese products. And most of the products are clothing, fashion, because China is one of the cheapest and biggest producers of the yeah. And but for this, but for cross border e-commerce, so what they meant by cross border is two ways. So they also want Chinese. Chinese uh, consumers to buy from overseas brands and of course everyone knows that uh, Chinese consumers have a very big appetite for foreign brands and since last year they have introduced VR for Chinese uh, VR using VR Chinese consumers can shop on Macy's New York's Macy's and if I remember correctly the sales for cross border e-commerce surged by 47% last year so this year there are two two fifth of the Ch brands on Timo are foreign brands right Mm, yeah. mm. So they are always emphasizing that Singles Day and Tmall especially is a platform for Chinese buyers to get to know foreign brands during the sales and vice versa for, for our consumers outside of China to know about Chinese brands. So we could see more and more cross-border in the future as another future growth area mm, still there's mm. still like mm. a lot more to be done and their quarterly earnings was released yesterday you mentioned about 100 percent of growth for cross border 115 uh, percent of the, what they call international commerce which is uh, what we term as a cross-border <laughs> growth yeah. and uh i guess just um there are a lot of research reports and stuff uh, coming out ahead of uh, next week seven days and i think they have mixed reactions so far um a news report saying that okay, consumers are totally numb because you you, you got to remember before November 11 next week there has been like a mm, slew of uh, uh, e-commerce festivals uh, in China. They all it's all named after dates, you know, 20th of May for I Love You and then 18th of June for that meet mid-level, uh, mid-year push, and then Nielsen is saying that they are absolutely numb of it, except for one, guess which one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then on the other hand, um, some some buyers are saying this Alibaba especially has a, a lot of credit in pushing single stay, but then the overall scene in terms of promotions is getting a little bit too complicated. I had uh, some people are saying, okay, they have a pre-launch sales 24 days before the actual day and with a whole set of terms and conditions and fine print almost like you're buying a banking product you know coupons can only be applied to certain models certain colors and you cannot apply a maximum discount if you combine you know 10 products together and then it's like you gotta have a math you gotta be really good in math in order to work out how much of a deal you're actually getting out of this so so then even though they say they're still excited about single state, but this is a maybe a is high it, and half low. Is it about thing. the deals anymore, or mm. is it just like about it's shopping time now and it's a celebration? Do people really feel like they're getting a bargain? Um, there, there are studies that are saying last year it was still more impulsive buys. They were still mm. drawn by the discounts, but this year I've seen at least a three reports you know, sent uh, from retail saying that there is a shift from impulsive to rational. You know in in one year in one year's time so to them they are pretty surprising and the market is trying to catch up uh, consumption shift to a more real time uh, marketing mm -hmm. it's the marketing spend that's going to be interesting to me and i'm kicking myself now because i don't remember what the brand was but at um, dma last year there was a brand that was uh talking about 
um, how basically they decided not to spend anything on Singles Day, but because it's such a big phenomenon, it still doubled their sales from mm. before, even though they didn't spend it much extra on it, but yeah. you know, obviously still participated in it. Mm. So I it's guess it won't be such an easy win this year because there are hundred and forty thousand <laughs> brands, and right. if you, if you, I guess my prediction, if you're not somehow involved in the new retail format, which is having an offline presence, you, you need to work a lot harder on marketing. There's right. a lot of clutter to break through. For sure. Mm. And, and then VR um, is still being in use, but then it's not, uh, it's not being as much hyped as last year. So we shall see. Well, interesting mm. to see what will be used to break through the clutter. And we're going to have a lot more coverage as well. Um, next week and as more kind of reports mm -hmm. come out you guys will be um, continuing to re report on that yeah, big and then, traffic jam online <laughs> for this whole week so anyways mm -hmm. there'll be more next week on highs and lows as well um, you're also mm -hmm. will be uh, heading out to Alibaba headquarters uh, that's right well, this year they are moving uh, their whole sort of big gala show apparently Fair Williams will be there from Hangzhou to Shanghai so hopefully um, next Friday same time and I'll be phoning in Hopefully, showing you some something and giving you a little bit of a live on the ground update uh, in the same spirit of new retail, you know, merging offline over there and online over here. Yeah. And right. Speaking about traffic jams, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Uber. Yeah. Yeah. Um, go so ahead. Uber they launched an Asian Asia wide campaign just a few days ago. So, it, so unlike the closest competitor, Grab. So. Grab is a, another ride-hailing company from Southeast Asia, Singapore, currently Singapore-based. Grab, so Uber is launching a very uh, connecting, using a very unifying theme of traffic problem to launch all the, to launch in Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and the North Asia markets, Hong Kong and Taiwan, because it's not in China anymore. So I asked them about how effective this is going to be since uh, so Uber cars are still on the road and it's not really reducing the traffic problems. Mm -hmm. So the marketing director, APEC marketing director told me that it's more about creating, generating conversations about traffic problems and he emphasized that it's very much based on insights from each country. For example, in in Philippines, they are saying that the number of cars could fill up 100,000 and 100, over football stations. 100, the cars on the road in Manila could fill up hundred, hundreds of football stations. So, and in Singapore, for example, they also launched a campaign with BBH about, to emphasize about parking problems. Because Singapore is, because in terms of the markets, not all of them have the same traffic problems. Like for Singapore, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, they are more advanced in public transport traffic problems, congestions is less of an issue, so it's, so they are based on insights on each of this. But uh, as I've spoken with um, our colleagues, we also wonder that how this could be an effective solution or effective approach for uh, to solve traffic problems, because some of the studies have mentioned that Uber and all the ride-hailing apps, they don't really solve traffic problems because people are finding it so easy to get a ride, so they just want to get a taxi and get into an Uber ride rather than just walking okay. yeah, yeah. for a short distance. And Uber, actually, they have a lot of data about how, they have a lot of data on traffic congestions and how much, what kind of rides that people are taking. So we are kind of surprised, I'm kind of intrigued that are they using this data to really solve the traffic problem or that could be the, more effective way to solve problems and also lowering the price or not hiking up the price during traffic during traffic jams. Right. Yeah. Well, it's again, it's about advertising, yeah. right? It's about getting their mm. brand out there. So yeah, I mean, I uh, the ad, by the way, I thought it was you know it's it's an effective ad in terms of you know, you see all these you know people uh, going around in boxes which tend to overrun the cities it seems like it, they give the almost the effect of overflowing garbage basically yeah. on the uh, <laughs> roads and it just feels like okay so uber is fighting this problem of congestion i can get behind that i have good feelings about uber does it make me want to go out and get an uber car no not really because you're seeing this kind of traffic problem but it does you know make you think like who's it's a it's a universal problem that everyone finds you know frustrating, like you said, especially in kind of a lot of um, the Asian cities here, was where it's 
issue and who's going to get behind it not the taxi the local taxi cab boards who don't have the money to kind of fund a kind of a broader campaign like this they're, they're like you said their biggest competitor is probably grab but that's still a little bit more regional so they're taking advantage of that and basically getting their name out there as in kind of a having this kind of universal pain point this irritant that people have and they're the ones trying to get ahead of it trying to, to, to associate their brand with it mm. I remember also speaking to another Uber marketer. I think they, they as a tech company, when they do marketing, has always envisioned marketing to what they call change culture, or at least you know, ignite some kind of shift in culture. So while it's not solving a practical problem directly or immediately, you know, uh, it's a lot of uh, factors other than control, like the number of cars, you know, tax policies. But um, just starting a conversation, as, sing uh, as skeptical as we are, you know, is a start, it's a starting point to something. Um, maybe it's a mid high. <laughs> I think we'll see. Yeah, we'll see about the effectiveness of the campaign, but I think it's a high for them in terms of just putting together a campaign that targets Asia in this way, right? Yeah. It's uh, it's got a lot of positive comments on social media, Twitter, because people like the ads and they think that it's very cute. Right. And the agency behind it is uh, is Borders Enforcement. They are, they are behind the SK two right. marriage takeover campaign. And Uber said they have a very long partnership with the agency and they know the brand strategy well. So this is because if you look at the marriage takeover campaign, it's also about creating conversation, mm -hmm. generating conversation. Mm -hmm. so solving problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yet. Yeah. Seems like a definitely so, a high then. Some some positive discussions. A lot more highs this week. Anyways, mm -hmm. it's um, that's that's about it for highs and lows this week. Um, we'll obviously have a lot more on Singles Day um, and what's both happened and what's just about to happen uh, next Friday. Um, Saturday is the single day. Is this the first time it falls on a Saturday? I don't remember. Uh, oh yes, that's right. Last year was also um, on a weekend. I remember then writing a follow-up story on Monday. Okay, mm. <laughs> so it's not a year. Yeah, um, more weekends better for, for buying. <laughs> that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll have a lot more on that and um, and everything else that we're covering next week. We'll be giving uh, other updates. During next week, we have uh, one reporter who's going to be at the Dreamforce conference in San Francisco. We have another reporter going to the Ad Asia conference in Bali. So reporting from all over. We'll, uh, we'll keep you updated. That's highs and lows this week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.